Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the webinar, AAPG webinar about geothermal energy basics. I'm going to present you some basic information about the general heat sources which feed geothermal plants, geothermal systems, and where our ancestors in the 18th century already thought about, as you see in this nice picture to the, to, the, uh, to the left called Opus Naturae is Opus Intelligentiae, where you see that people were already thinking about the Earth core and other heat sources which feed volcanoes, which are the products of the interaction of this heat with water, the surface and deep inside the Earth, which form such famous hot spots, including hot springs, hot lakes, such as the, the Yellowstone caldera, with this famous lake where heat uh, loving algae are living and giving these fantastic colors to, to this lake. And humans are using this heat and they started um, on an industrial level in the beginning of the 20th century in a place called Ladarello in Italy. I'm also going to talk a little bit about Ladarello, about the history of geothermal energy and which types of geothermal plants we know. But let's get into Medias Res. So where does the heat come from we enjoy on our planet? So the, the main part is still uh, the remaining heat from the um, early days of Earth when uh, asteroids and meteorites uh, agglomerated to form our wonderful planet and this heat is mainly stored in the in the core of the Earth and the outer core is even partially molten so here we really melt which is also responsible for for the Earth's magnetic field because this uh, molten material is uh, is convecting very fast and uh, is rich in iron, so we get a kind of dynamo which is responsible for the <coughs> for the heat that is disseminated from the core via the mantle towards the crust. But within the crust, also, in particular the continental crust. Um, Heat is produced by radioactive decay of certain elements, which are very rich, uh, enriched in, um, in granites. And here we have to think in particular about potassium, thorium, and uranium. So a granitic crust with potassium. Oops, let's see, that was obviously wrong. Potassium, thorium, uranium. Um, which decay and uh, which form radiogenic heat. And so we can state, uh, make some general statements about the heat within our, our planet. So we can say 99% of the Earth is hotter than 1000 degrees Celsius. Only 0.01 is, has a lower temperature than 100 degrees C. And the entire heat content of our planet is in the range of 10 to the power of 30 Joule. And if we look at what mankind is using every year, it's only yes, some magnitude smaller than this amount. So why not using this heat? So why not using it and why not learning more about it? And we simply have to look at the geothermal gradient, which is usually under normal plate tectonic conditions. So not at destructive, active, passive whatsoever plate margins, but in a stable content. We very often have 30 degrees in the least case 10 degrees centigrade per kilometer or kelvin in this case so that's heat we can use for heating and for power production and <clears throat> a lot of um, um, temperature usable temperature is uh, related to to aquifers we can gain this temperature we are medium and this medium is water so if we look at, at aquifer temperatures when we see certain areas which are very high temperatures in the range of 120 to 150 degree temperatures, which are well suitable for electricity generation. 
And we can even go down to, to, to small temperatures below 30 degrees, so 10 to 30 degrees Celsius uh, centigrade uh, are suitable for the production of, of, of heat, of, uh, for municipal heating, uh, uh, district heating systems or individual homes could be heated by this manner. And if we look at the very hot areas, they are very often related to mountain ranges such as the Himalayas. We find them here in the Alps, of course. We find them in the Andes. Down here, we find them in the um, yes, at the Pacific margin of the of North America, but also in the stable continental situations in the uh, um, in the the center of the of the Australian Craton, or if we look at uh, the center of the of Africa, we also find very high temperatures, which you can use easily for energy production, in particular for power production. Okay, let's have another perspective, another view on production of geothermal energy. And we see clearly that all these pinkish areas here, that's obviously the, the Pacific margin, is very suitable for um, geothermal power production, but also um, extensional settings such as the Great Rift Valley or the Red Sea and all these um, extensional regimes. And I think the most famous extensional regime, or one of the most, one is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which we have basically here. And we have several hotspots sitting on there. So the most famous one, of course, is Iceland. And we also find the Azores and other islands, and all those are favorable for producing geothermal energy. And we could really produce a lot, a lot, a lot, if we just look at the numbers. Those numbers here are in, um, in megawatts. So we could produce, if we look at Asia, 70,000 megawatts. We could install really a huge amount of, uh, of, of power here. And what is what so far is installed? It's on the one hand, it's inspiring and encouraging. So we have some 4,500 megawatts already installed here in Asia, and uh, roughly 8,000 are uh, inferred and projected and uh, under construction and so on and so on. But there's huge potential which is not yet used. And this is important to do, this is important to use, because one important message I would like you to take home from today is that geothermal power is base load capable. So different from other renewable energies, such as solar energy or eolic energy, I really depend on the sun is shining, the wind is blowing. Geothermal energy is available anytime, any year round, anywhere basically, as I'm going to show you just in a second. <clears throat> so, how does a typical geothermal reservoir, geothermal system look like? Which important elements do we need? So, we have a nice um, picture here, which we could even make a little bit more easy if we look at, at certain elements. What do we need for a geothermal reservoir to, to work? We need some heat source, which we have here, in this case a magma intrusion, which could be also a, a cooling, radiogenic heat producing granite, so it doesn't have to be really magma in action. It could simply be the, the geothermal gradient, which could be a little bit higher, so different ways of um, producing this. So we need heat in the first place. And we could, produce, we could transport energy, and, uh, and uh, of course, in two ways. We could do it conductively. So we could have con conductive or convective heat transfer. And of course, as you can already see from the, the colors I have chosen, the convective heat transfer is of course much faster and for convective heat transfer we need a medium to, to, to transport the heat with yeah, whatsoever, gas or fluid and of course though the most uh, um, easily available, most frequent fluid we have uh, is of course water. We have meteoric water, we have water within the crust and this water is traveling through the crust and uh, is traveling downward. Is 
cold water as we see here. Well, this water is getting hot as soon as it gets closer to, to the heat source and can move upward as hot water where then can um, can be observed by us either unused, either a hot spring or a steam vent or we can even drill for it with a geothermal well to make it more easily accessible for us. But how does the water travel? So what is important? What do we need? We need of course either an aquifer, you see here, so these uh, the brick signature could be a limestone, so we would have a, an aquifer where the water is blowing, flowing in the pore space. Or we could use these faults as pathways to transport the water down toward the heat source and to move it up again. Down and up again. So faults would be important. So there are three things which are important. So we need water, heat, and we need to need pathways. So pathways. So we make that more clear. So what do we need? We need heat plus water plus pathways. Now that's basically it. Maybe we don't need. It's really about everything necessary for installation of a geothermal or a usable geothermal system. Okay, and this was already well known from early, early times, so some 10,000 years before um, before birth of Christ, people knew about the usage of these uh, geothermal um, uh, manifestations, hot springs, fumaroles, whatsoever. I don't want to go through these individual points, you can read them, you get the, the, the presentation, of course. But uh, we see kind of a uh, continuum. If we look at my hometown, Wiesbaden in Germany, then we see there's a, a well called the boiling well. Kochbrunnen means boiling well. And although the well is not boiling at all, it has 760 degrees, it's really much more temperature than we need for, for heating. And uh, you see the modern manifestation, the modern, uh, yeah, um, shape of the well made in the 80s but this spring was already used by as you can see by, by the by the romans and the, the people from 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 yeah, italy starting with the etruscans they were really the first to uh, first to, to use even an industrial scale uh, geothermal fluids for uh, um, for producing borax for for, you know, for producing animal and funny enough we can make a direct line from the Etruscans and from their place, the place where they were living in, in Tuscany to the modern industrial usage of geothermal energy <coughs> to the place called Laderello, which is also in Tuscany and where the owners of a plant for uh, animal production also produced their borax first from these, uh, from, from, the, from the local um, from the local hot springs, actually, and finally they found out they could not only need to use the uh, the water, the, the chemistry of the water, but they could also use the heat of the water, and finally established a, a geothermal power plant. I will show you in the next slide how the development was very shortly. But you, if you go to the to the right, to the graph to the, to the lower right, you can see that the um, development growth of, of geothermal energy is really encouraging. So if we go back to 1950, we do not even have five terawatt hours produced of geothermal energy. And in the early Laderello times, it was even, even less. So we could extrapolate this to the left and see that there's almost nothing. And then with the awareness that the fossil resources, the resources of, of hydrocarbons uh, will end, that they will not last forever. People were getting more and more interested in other resources, and renewable resources, and one of those was geothermal energy. And if you look at the 1980s, the growth is almost exponential, and we can hope for even more. So how did it start? It really started all in Laderello, and just to show you where 
Ladarello is situated. I told you it's in in Tuscany, in, in, in Italy. You see it here, Ladarello. Oops. Yep. So, uh, and if you look here, you have a map where you see the, the geothermal or the, the, the heat production of Italy. And actually, Tuscany is really the hotspot, the hottest uh, area, or the most heat producing area within Italy. So, it's no, uh, not by accident that this was the place where the first, where the family Gino Conti, which owned this uh, borax and animal plant, um, started their uh, geothermal activities. So this is Piero Gino Conti in 1904, who used this uh, steam-driven uh, uh, turbine, which we see here. Here's the steam generator, here you see the, the, the manometer for pressure man measurement and so on. And this was not used for, for a lot, well, only five light bulbs actually were lit with this, but it took them only seven years, from 1904 to 1911, to establish the first power plant. Here you see the, um, probably not sure the, the drilling work, it looks like a, bit like, a, like a steam gusher whatsoever. And in 1913 they were capable of producing uh, electricity power from from the steam and even at that time 250 kilowatts which was enough to supply part of the electricity necessary for the electric uh, for the Italian railway in the in the area and from there on make a big jump towards today so history has gone on and um, um, the owner is no longer the, the family Gino Conti but nowadays the, the state owned Enel uh, company which produces some 5,000 gigawatt hours um, to uh, supply electricity to more than 1,000 homes in the surrounding of, of Ladarello. So that's how it started. And then we were talking about where there was steam used in this plant. <coughs> and where does the steam come from? And uh, where is, uh, how is uh, such a power plant run? That's will be the topic of the next, next few minutes. So let's have a look at this. Um, this nice um, figure. So what are the important things? So first of all, we see um, two to the right, different, different gradients. So we see gradient very, very hot, a geothermal gradient of 10 degrees Celsius per 100 meters. This would be really in a volcanic area. So we would reach um, 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 100 degrees already after, after, after 1000 meters. So and from uh, as farther we go to the right, the cooler the system gets, and it gets many more and more depths and more and more drilling meters to, to get into economically interesting areas. But it's not only the heat that we need, it's also, as I told you, the water, what might be present or not present, and the, 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 not only the, um, the distance to, to, the, to the heat source, which here also is a magmatic system. So we might have systems where water is present, those called hydrothermal systems. <clears throat> we are always talking, this may be important, I will also talk about it a bit later, uh, we are talking about deep-seated uh, geothermal systems. So hydrothermal systems have the, the beauty of water being present and we do not need to take, to, we need to take care for transporting water down, to, which we then have to heat up to, to, to use it then as the carrier of heat, but this we have to do in case of a dry rock, and this rock at, at this depth, so we have a temperature of already some 300 degrees, which is well um, capable of producing electricity from it. This is dry hot, but it's dry, so we have to enhance it, and we have to enhance it by causing fractures, which then um, connect to well bores, one well bore where we transport cold water down and one well bore where we uh, transport the through the fracture driven water upward where we then can produce electricity from it. <coughs> so let's have a closer look at what types of reservoirs we have in a more um, ordered, more um, 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 classification manner. So first of all, we can distinguish 
uh, geothermal energy from from the depth from where we gain it so we could, can say okay we gain um, energy from the very surface that would be below 400 meters this example here so we don't go, go very deep and of course temperatures are not very high at this depth we generally can talk about some 10 degrees centigrade which is enough for for heat production for for district heating for greenhouse heating for fish farming for whatsoever in this area we can we do not need a lot of energy this would be sufficient for producing electricity we have to go deeper so electricity we can make here let's see from here this is already where are the light bulbs of the Italians of La Darella could have been lit from and this is deep geothermal energy either we can do it um, just by exchanging heat from a, um, from a geothermal probe cold water going down getting warm down there and back up but we could also use directly the, the water which is present in a so-called hydrothermal system which could be the be driven by by water of an aquifer down there the pore space would be here the the most important thing to think about maybe also some micro fractures whatsoever but no major so let's say fractures as well or even micro fractures but no falls those would be then a very deep seated system where we might have crustal scale falls along which water water is flowing which we could then use and would produce hot water up and would re-inject oops wrong color would re-inject the cold water then to to feed the system those are all systems where water is present hydrothermal system but if the water is missing and we have to introduce water from, from the surface we probably also do lack the the pathways between the, the well bores which we are establishing we don't, not only need to bring the water down we also need to produce the fractures first that's where all these um, fields stand for so we have to enhance improve the probability of the system by by fracking basically so this would be a fracking driven geothermal system this would be a yeah let's say a natural oops let's write it more clear natural system okay petrothermal systems are of course also of interest in particular for people like me who work with geomechanics so this is very can play around a lot okay let's compare those two settings hydrothermal versus petrothermal a little bit more in detail so hydrothermal is maybe the, the dream of every uh, geothermal reservoir engineer because you have an existing reservoir probably an aquifer and if you're lucky you really have temperatures of 150 degrees centigrade or more so that we can not only produce heat for direct use but we can produce via this turbine electricity so in case of a petrothermal system we have the heat maybe we can even drill deeper and get to higher temperatures which are more and more suitable of course let's assume here some 250 degrees Celsius. but what we are lacking is water and we are also lacking the pathway so we have only the heat of the three elements of a running geothermal system we are lacking in first place two elements so we have to produce first of all we are fracking so we could use the, the future production and reinjection wells uh, for producing the, the pathways between those two we have to introduce um, and engineer the, um, the fracture network between the two drill uh, well bores and for this purpose we need to know the stress field to yes to, to know the direction where the uh, fractures are going to grow and to, where to place the, the uh, second uh, well bore in relation to the first one <coughs> and we have to bring down the water so we have one well one in injection well where the cold water is going down 
which is feeding the reservoir, which is then step by step. We have this heat exchanger, natural heat exchanger, what is the earth at this moment, is heated up, and then we can produce from this one. I'm going to write this and hope this works. In this manner, we are going to produce hot water. And if we use, and I'm going to talk about this in a, in a, in a minute, a binary plant, so we have a heat exchanger here as well. So we do not directly use the heat gained from, from, from down there, we are exchanging it. And but finally, anywhere which we have kind of plant, we have a turbine again run by any kind of steam or vapor, produce electricity as you can see here. So that's it. <clears throat> and the nice thing about petrothermal systems is that they are present everywhere. We have our geothermal gradient of some 30 degrees per um, per one thousand meters so we can easily use it anywhere in Quietus actually and an aquifer with a sufficient temperature is, is rather rare but I'm also going to introduce an example to you where this is actually the case. Okay, petrothermal versus hydrothermal. But we could also, I was already talking about direct use, the only heat uh, use of uh, geothermal energy versus uh, uh, electricity, which we could have, yeah, maybe give these two colors, low energy for heating only, and let's make it like that, and high enthalpy, high temperature areas where you can also make electricity from. So, and a lot of people have worked about this, as you can see, starting in the area and uh, remember the, the, the graph where you have seen that the curve of geothermal use really gets exponential. So beginning of the 80s, end of the, end of the 70s, people were trying to categorize high versus low enthalpy uh, reservoirs. And you could make, simply make a line like that if you really want to do that. The, the 150 degree, that's really the the main line. At 150 degree, there we distinguish high versus low. High meaning electricity. Oh, let's say with blue. Electricity power. And below, low, we have mainly heat to produce from it. Okay, that's something you should uh, take home with you. 150 degree is the main boundary between high and low enthalpy um, geothermal reservoirs. Okay, once again, not as a graph, but maybe more as a, as a, as a chart, as a spreadsheet. So at high temperatures, high temperatures, okay, here they are defined as 220 degrees centigrade. But we could go into the, in the, into the intermediate field, there's power generation and heat, direct use, heat, possible, so the same for intermediate temperatures, which you could well <coughs> summarize together with the high temperature fields. And of course, here we have water and steam, here we have only water, and when we come to the low enthalpy, low, ent low enthalpy regime, with these 50 to 150 degrees, we have only water and we only can can heat. We cannot produce electricity from our geothermal reservoir. And here to the very right you have different types of um, um, geothermal power plants and uh, apparatuses you need to uh, uh, to use the heat and uh, in this low enthalpy regime which is very often also the, the, um, the near surface reservoirs you always need Heat pumps. Heat pumps, okay, they're also named for well, the other two systems, but the heat pump is really the main energy increasing apparatus for low enthalpy um, near surface systems. And as further you get down, and as hotter it gets, as more directly can you use steam and hot water for flashing and uh, direct fluid use. Whatsoever. And now we're going to talk, I guess, a little bit about the three main types of 
geothermal plants. And the most easy way to, to do it is really to, to be deep enough, hot enough <coughs> to produce from your production well, what we have here, production well, to produce directly steam. And this steam is hot enough and has a high enough pressure to to run the turbine directly and the turbine then can go can produce electricity in the generator and we have power that's what we want so what do we do with a uh, with the steam we get from the reservoir we allow it to cool down in a direct and uh, two circle system actually so if a cooling tower also included we use cool air from the surrounding to cool the water down and why do we do that to uh, send the water back via the injection well towards the geothermal reservoir where it can heat up again and we have to take care we have to to balance <coughs> our system that we produce enough water or to, to inject enough water towards the reservoir to to feed the system to allow it to heat up again we should not do it too fast to cool down the system we should not do it too slow to to move too much water from the reservoir to, to dry it up we have to find a, a balance and this is one of the most important things with geothermal systems actually okay not all, only a few of the power plants existing nowadays really, really do use the directly the, the steam coming from that because most geothermal wells do not produce steam, but they produce, produce water. So there's hot water coming up from here. And this hot water is of course under pressure. And we can release the pressure and produce by pressure release so you should write pressure release. Oops. We produce steam, and from then on, uh, the, the plant works the same way as the direct steam use. The steam has enough pressure to run the turbine. We are going to cool uh, our water down. Of course, we can use the part of the water. Not too much because we want later on to, to re-inject it uh, for, for heating. This is also a way to do it and we can <coughs> add finally, okay here we have the electricity production, here we have the, the heat production. And we could also add to such a flash plant, we could also add um, uh, the third type of plant which is a binary plant which is very popular actually in, in, in Germany where we don't have high enthalpy uh, reservoirs but low enthalpy reservoirs and uh, or intermediate uh, at least and where you do they need to use some tricks or some fluids which are not uh, water to um, to heat um, yes to, to, to produce a, a vapor and those call those um, plants are called binary cycle power plants binary power plants so why are they called binary because we do not use the material the water the steam whatsoever coming directly from the production well so we have not one cycle we have two cycles so the first cycle the water cycle is the cycle from the reservoir upward and down again but then we have a, a second cycle And this is a, a cycle which is not run by uh, by water, but we have a heat exchanger connecting the two cycles. So the heat from the first cycle is transferred to the second cycle, where we have uh, very often uh, an organic uh, fluid. Um, we have to, you know two two types of um, of geothermal power plants of this type, the so-called uh, organic Rankine (ORC) cycle organic Rankine cycle and we have then also the Kalina this is a, a Russian engineer Kalina 
um, cycle of Colina type plant we could call it. they're mainly different by the the, the um, um, organic material they use very often uh, that we use some uh, alcohol some uh, ethanol for example anyway uh, uh, a fluid which has a much lower boiling point as water and which could then also produce steam or vapor or an organic vapor which then is, has of course not the same amount of energy as the steam the dry steam or the flash steam but still can run a turbine and we end up with electricity and of course we have also a yeah actually a kind of a third cycle or a cooling cycle where we use air to to condense um, the the fluid once again um, and allow it to to come back to 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 a fluid stage to a liquid stage and to be heated up again by the hot water coming from the production well and of course the the first cycle runs as in the other two types of of power plants the water is cooling down as we inject and of course we have to take the same care not to um, transport too much water at the same time down to cool the thermal reservoir um, fast uh, and we have to take care to produce not too low amount of uh, to re-inject not too low amount of water not to dry out our um, our geothermal reservoirs. So basically three types of, of plants uh, direct steam use um, flash plants very depending on the, the, the energy within the hot water we can use one flash process two flash process and we can add uh, such a binary plant to a flash plant <coughs> or we can use in, in case we have not enough uh, hot water down there simply a binary plant for um, energy production okay and I want to start now with, we'll give you now two, two um, examples for different types of uh, reservoirs, one for low enthalpy and one for high enthalpy. And the low enthalpy example comes from, from my home country, from Germany, from the south of Germany, Bavaria, the, the Munich area. So here they have the, the famous Frauenkirche here in Munich. And, uh, well, that's maybe of least interest of the derrick here is maybe of more more interesting so we have a lot of drilling activity for for warm or even hot water down to really great depth so the deepest uh, um, well bore is some six thousand meter deep at gerrit's reed unfortunately not, not very successful it was too dry so there was not enough water or water was flowing too fast <clears throat> even if the temperatures were sufficient, they were higher than here, they were around some 160 degrees even so. But generally we produce some 104 degrees simply because we are very deep and we um, um, get the water down in this aquifer. So it's an aquifer driven and this um, has in German a thermal, thermal water carrying limestone. So this would be limestone. It would be a Jurassic limestone, actually, from the upper Jurassic, from from the Malm. Okay, and this uh, horizon, this uh, stratum, is going down because it is in this in the Molasse Basin. Northern Molasse Basin of the Alps. So here we have this beautiful mountain range. The Alps just south of Munich and the of course with increasing depth the temperature is also increasing in the northernmost spot where geothermal energy from this aquifer from this uh, stratigraphic horizon is used is the beautiful city of Straubing close to the river Donau um, where the um, Riskin uh, mountain range or the Riskin basement uh, is popping up, so we would have a smaller mountain range here, the Bavarian forest, but I think that's not so much of interest. We should maybe name the, the Alps here. This could be helpful. Okay, and okay, temperature 104 degrees, quite deep aquifer, and it's used for both. It's used for heat production, 
mainly for heat protection, but also so for some part for power production by binary plants. I'm going to show you now how this looks. So this is the, the <coughs> greater Munich area. So that's the, the inner city is the dark blue area. The um, outskirts are basically here, and this is um, then all the area which is still of interest in terms of um, yes, municipal district heating and so on. And the direct symbol which you see here, those are geothermal plants, and then we have the general plant system, uh, plant symbol here, those are um, heat and power plants, so which do not only use geothermal energy, in particular this uh, uh, combined heat and power plant north, uh, does mainly use conventional gas, um, uh, gas driven or gas produced electricity and heat. But here all these power plants here, Zawola for example, the one which you saw, oops, let's go back, which you see here, we have a well bore, some, some 5,000 meter steps. Um, the Sawala plant produces uh, electricity, some 5 megawatts only, you could say, but it's still for 5 megawatts. Then we have here the combined Kirchstockach and Dürrha power plants, which produce 7 megawatts. And um, so all in all, we have some 10 to 20 megawatts of of uh, electrical power produced in the Munich area, but the m main part is really heat, what we are producing here. Oops. We're really going for heat in each of these power plants. Some 45 megawatts in Kirchstocker and Dürrha. We're producing 4 megawatts in Sauerlach. And here is a major project in this uh, combined heat and power plant south. There are 50 megawatts. Uh, a plant and the the the, uh, the idea of the uh, administration of Munich is to uh, substitute all non-renewable energy for heat production in Munich until 2040 by renewable energy and the, the major part of this will be geothermal energy which we are going to use. So a very uh, important project, uh, kind of a uh, Example project, if this works, it would be a great example for geothermal energy all over Europe, I guess. Okay, let's get to, to something, not something, but somehow completely different to high enthalpy. And of course, Germany is not a good example for high enthalpy because we do not have uh, active subducting plate margins. We do not have, okay, there are some volcanoes, but those are, that's, that's another story. But the real volcanic areas are around along the Ring of Fire uh, at the Pacific Rim, and one of my favorite places because we and uh, uh, from Gestein's Labor, together with our fellow colleagues from Koingelse, are planning actually a, a, a geothermal power plant there. We are still in the, the very first stage of, of, of uh, we didn't even start exploration, but <clears throat> we are very, uh, very positive about the future of this system and we would not be the first to, to introduce uh, geothermal power to to this uh, country. So Nicaragua is of course here in Central America. It is uh, yeah characterized by its very prominent plate tectonic situation. So the Cocos plate is subducting underneath the Caribbean plate and the, the result of this is besides some earthquakes, even some major earthquakes, a lot of volcanism. So we see all these nice triangles, and in the figure to the to the right, uh, even more of these triangles with all these um, volcanoes. And one of these volcanoes, the Motombo, is even the area where the first um, power plant was installed in um, in Nicaragua. The Motombo plant, nineteen eighty three, which produced produces until now. 78 megawatts and in the neighborhood of Motombo was the second power plant installed with the San Jacinto Tisate, which was started in 2005 and until today some 72 megawatts are installed there and as you can see here when I go back from here it's not only a flash plant but we also have a 
binary plant. So this combination I was talking about, so we have a flash process for producing steam for running a turbine and with a raining heat, we could even run a binary plant or a C or Kalina type um, power plant. And then if there's enough heat uh, remaining, we could even run a um, um, some so you make some some direct use direct uh, use of the heat for fish farming for greenhouses whatsoever, what is needed. Okay. <clears throat> okay. With the next slides, I'm heading to the last topic of 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 this talk about uh, heading towards um, towards geothermal exploration and planning of a project. And what is shown here is, yes, um, actually it's. Um, even if there's bankability, it could, could also be time, what is written here, because the project is, is growing from the pre-survey to, to the startup of the, of the power plant and its, its operation finally. And what is on the, on the y-axis is the project risk, what we have. So, and as you can see, the, the costs, of course. And you can see that the, the risk is the highest during the first stages. And that's also what I'm going to talk about. So we, we are going to, to here to next slides to exploration. That's where the highest risk is. Of course, the costs are still not very high, but well, then the, the crucial point is here, where the costs are really exploding and the risk is still very high. So with the drilling, that's really the important point. When, when drilling is done, when drilling is done, then we could be could relax a little bit. Then we are maybe on the safe side and the project could really run smoothly finally. First of all, we really have to do the exploration <clears throat> and which elements are important for, for geothermal exploration. I'm not going to, to go through the entire list. You can read that carefully for yourself. But here we have three important things. Geology, of course, is important. Geophysics is important. And geochemistry. But in the next minutes, I'm going to stress Two further points, geomechanics, of course, is important. We need to know how is our crust reacting because we are playing around with the crust. We are adding water, we are removing water and so on and so on. We are playing around with the pore pressure and we have to develop a model which combines all our exploration knowledge and which is, first of all, made for testing of our exploration results, but also for um, giving us an idea about uh, where we're moving, uh, about uh, the, the forecast, how is our weather war developing. Okay, so as you can see here, such a project doesn't have to run very long. We have maybe a horizon of, of, ten, of, of 10 months to one year. So let's say basically one year should be sufficient to go from the first important step, literature, literature search, towards, yes, um, our first, um, yes, more than exploration well bore, which could be even the first production well bore. And from there, uh, within this time frame, we have certain important things to do, of course, which we're we talking about. We have to do the geology, we have to do the geophysics, which could all be done within the first half year. We can, we have to do, um, uh, geochemistry, as you can see here, but we also have to nowadays in particular to take care about the environment, about the social risks which are related to our geothermal project. Okay, but let's focus on what we are best at, at geoscience. So, and um, geology, the role of geology is of course to, to know the area, to know the, the basic structure of the area, to know the stratigraphy and to com combine all this and best to combine all this in a map. And here I, uh, I have a map of this uh, F, um, very nice Eloyo Monte Galan area, which is a particular of interest for us. So we have, as you can see, um, an area uh, with, um, um, yeah, where you have a lot of sediments, maybe here this yellow area and two major volcanic complexes. On this Monte Galan complex, and you can distinguish different uh, edifices. So the Monte Galan caldera is somewhere here in this area, and we have to the north, so the El Hoyo um, volcano, 
um, which is basically here. With some, which is not only one volcano, but each of these uh, colors signifies a different volcanic edifice. And this map even gives more information. If you just look on the key, it gives some structural information here. Gives information about where samples were taken, sample locations. So all this should be incorporated in such a map, which helps you to evaluate your in the first step your uh, geothermal reservoir. Of course, stratigraphy is important. Okay, here we have only a very general uh, stratigraphic columns for for Nicaragua. So nothing what um, is maybe now usable in detail, but um, uh, already here uh, several. Um, strata distinguishable, which might be of interest. So here, these volcanic plastic, uh, volcanic uh, sediment uh, um, layers and, and rocks, and, and the alluvial rocks, which have a high probability, high porosity, which could be the rocks where our geothermal fluids flow in. And then we have special maps, so such, for example, the structural map. I've talked about the importance of pathways. So all these faults that we see here. In the Aloyo area, or the falls, which, um, um, which uh, border our, our caldera of the second volcano, the Monte Caldan, Galan, could be very important as pathways for the water. As you see, for example, here, this could correspond quite well with uh, alteration zones. So, the uh, faulting activity could. could promote alteration here in the Monte Galan area, here we have the caldera, we have a lot of the brownish areas are uh, alteration areas. Here's the same for the Eloyo, alteration, and uh, some strange vegetation as well, and this coincides very well with all these faults. So those are, those are things we have to combine when we do careful mapping. <coughs> okay, geophysics, I think all of you <coughs> who are busy with, with uh, uh, petroleum and gas reservoirs know a lot about geophysical methods. So in, since uh, geothermal exploration is basically nothing else than uh, uh, um, hydrocarbon exploration, only in this case looking for hot water, so the methods are basically the same. So we use gravity measurements, we measure the magnetic field, we look for electric, electric resistivity, which is a good sign for us, so low resistivity means there's a lot of water. We use magnetic lyrics and we use seismic measurements and I'm only going to give you a short idea about some possible um, measures. So from Nicaragua, but also from, um, not from the Molasse base in Germany, but a little bit further to the, to the north, um, northwest to the Franconian basin. So we have also uh, an area with a positive uh, positive geothermal anomaly, which is situated just around this Mürsbach village, where we have a well bore, a very famous well bore, where we have a geothermal gradient of 5 degrees centigrade per uh, 100 meters. And this goes down to here, this is really about the shape of the geo of the anomaly. So T, I'll give it another kind of color. Uh, let's say T and normally that's not easy to, to, lead, to read. Let's again, or just let's say temperature anomaly. But this temperature anomaly coincides also with the gravity anomaly. The map to the left is actually a gravity map. So we have areas in yellow where we have positive anomalies. Let's see, have a, uh, uh, um, a complex which con consists of um, mafic rocks, uh, the so-called um, Münchbach nice mass, which is based by amphibolites and uh, actually uh, oceanic crust. And then we have negative anomalies, as here, here, but also which is all in the area where the basement is uh, cropping out. So that's basement here. All this area would be basement. But here we have here we have also a positive anomaly, a negative anomaly, and this is where we have uh, within the sedimentary basin. So this area would be here, and this here would be there. 
So those are the gravity curves, actually. The, the, the dashed one is a modeled one, and the uh, uh, straight line here, which I'm just following, is the measured one. So we have a negative anomaly, then we have a close to the fault, which um, where the basement is, uh, <coughs> has emerged. We have a, a slight positive anomaly, but then we come into the granites, and those granites make a negative anomaly. And we build a model, and this model shows that there could be inferred the presence of a granite at depth, which is responsible for the negative anomaly. And this granite could, of course, also serve as a, a radiogenic heat source uh, for geothermal energy, as a radiogenic geothermal reservoir. So that's what we could do by gravity modeling. Seismic, of course, is important because I was talking about pathways. So this is for the same area. So I just point out the Mersbach well. So the anomaly would be something like that. It could be well related also to the Graben structure, which we see here. But Staffelstein is here. The Staffelstein Graben will be in this area. And we see we have some faults. And these faults are very easily detectable by seismic methods and the, the main fault, the Franconian line, which we have here, which separates the basement area from the sedimentary basin, is actually this one. And there are a number of smaller faults and all these faults could be used as pathways for waters traveling down, traveling up, yeah, transporting over heat down, uh, cold water down, hot water up, and so on and so on. So seismic is also important. <clears throat> Moreover, geochemistry, of course, we need to know the chemical character of the surface manifestations of our geothermal activity. We need to know the hot springs of the chemistry. We need to extrapolate our data to depth. We can use these data to, to uh, reconstruct the, the temperature at depth to make a thermometry. And we want to have a model for fluid flow at depth and therefore the chemistry is also important and I'm going to show you an example of some research uh, I was involved in and it was maybe, mainly used for um, earthquake prediction or earthquake prediction project but uh, by uh, hydro geochemical means but it's also a very nice example for um, um, yes for, for changes in uh, water reservoirs uh, due to stress changes due to earthquake activity and this could be also a nice measure and nice this is a nice example for um, yeah how modeling of reservoir changes could also affect hydrothermally interesting reservoirs so that's the study takes place in in iceland here as you see in the north of iceland in the thurnus fracture zone and there happened in september uh, 2002 um, a major earthquake, 5.8, and we were lucky enough to start the sampling of uh, uh, hydrothermal waters in uh, in July, and so we had a quite a quite nice record for a lot of things before the earthquake and after the earthquake, and some things I want to to highlight. So we have some major peaks in copper, zinc, and manganese just before the earthquake at different times. We have a strong change in all these elements from borium, potassium, uh, calcium, lithium, and so on. They all increase directly after the earthquake. So we see a, a strong drop in delta O18 from before the earthquake to after the earthquake. So all this is probably related to, to a change in, in, in reservoir and, or, and, uh, or reservoir history which is related to, to the earthquake. So we could decipher um, several pathways or paths. So we saw that starting with this water composition here in the Delta 18 plot, we first saw um, a source mixing of different sources. And if you look at the, these, uh, this model, down here, so it could be well that surface metering water was mixed with seawater. And then, then in the second step, 
the reservoir changed from a surface meteoric water which mixed with seawater during the earthquake that point is really the closest to the earthquake we have and then changed to another um, to another source water source which would then be a uh, ice age meteoric water maybe something glacial whatsoever so this such a history could also be done for any other geothermal reservoir so coming back to our example from Nicaragua we can do from a lot of uh, hydrogeothermal data as we see here all these individual points are sampling points where we got brown numbers are temperatures the green numbers are the sodium chlorine uh, the, the chlorine uh, content um, moreover we see fumaroles and so on and lila and so on from all this we can do a, a very nice um, model and can uh, get an idea about different types of reservoirs so we see these four different so four different superficial water types of water areas we see this okay it's good for this with this this chlorine rich area um a we also a lot of b carbonate in here then we see um within this group c um here we have uh, sulfur rich waters sulfur here that's maybe not to wonder because we are close to the monte galan so that's the monte galan volcano and finally um we have um uh, some sodium rich waters which can be deciphered as this group d water so we can distinguish different waters we can even even try to make a model of the fluid flow where the water flows superficially in different directions and uh, leads even to to a kind of, of mixing so this entire uh, group b is, is, is a mixing area of different waters so that's what all we can do with hydrogeochemistry so very important tool in this in this context and then of course geomechanics is important we, will, we need to know the stress state we need to know the strength we need to know the way the rock is fracturing the directions of fracturing and we want to int introduce all these data also into a model which should not also encompass geochemistry and geophysics and geology but also the mechanical properties of the rocks <clears throat> and you probably all know the more circle and here we have more circles for three different types of rocks we have very soft sandstone here in here this rock the sandstone sustains only very low differential stresses low differential stress it's a soft rock and then we have in blue a granite which is very strong with high differential stresses stress Okay, and with a high angle of internal friction, so high angle of internal friction in contrast to the sandstone. So soft versus versus strong. So that's what we can distinguish very easily. But we can use these data together with some stress data and I don't want to stress this so too strong there's a method called RACOS rock anisotropy characterization of samples is named so that's the RACOS method developed by our fellow colleague uh, Roland Braun from Potsdam close to Berlin which allows us to, to characterize the stress field in this area actually data come from these over these well in this Mürsbach temperature anomaly which allows us to characterize the stress field or the main or the principal stresses so those are the principal stresses so this would be S1 would be aligned northwest southeast S1 northwest the minimum stress would be also in the horizontal so this would be northeast and this would be S3 or SH min and the intermediate stress would be here so we would have a strike slip regime strike slip 
And if we apply the stress data together with our strength data, we see fields of stability. So the orange field, or the orange plane is stable. And if we are under peak conditions, so peak, there are no, no fractures yet, peak conditions, no fractures, our stable field, and here we have the strike slip field is quite big. And as soon as we are under residual conditions, this field gets much smaller, as you can see. So, so we get, we weaken our rock, and that's something trivial, we weaken our rock, weakening by fracturing. But this gives us information about where stability, where do we produce fracks, which we need for developing a petrothermal reservoir as an enhanced geothermal reservoir. We want to avoid later on the seismic activities, so we have to reduce pore fluid pressure, for example. All these data can be retrieved from geomechanics. Okay, and finally, we can put all these things into a model to get a holistic view on the reservoir and to get a good prognosis for the future development of the reservoir. And I just want to give you again this example from, from the Franconian Basin. So we are again here at Mürsbach. So we have the, uh, the, the thermal anomaly. We see that there are no faults, pathways for, uh, for, uh, for cold waters down warm waters up, uh, several derricks, several well bores, and so on. And there is a heat source, which we do not know yet. And we were interested in the heat source. What are the heat source? We developed two models. So one conductive model, so a model where heat is transferred only conductively from a granite body, which has intruded some 300 million years ago when it was cooling down and then disseminating radiogenic heat through the decay of potassium, thorium and uranium. Okay, so as you can see we have some heat here, there's also total heat flux, total heat flux from depth, from the mantle actually, and this together gives us a geothermal profile. What has not too much to do with the actual situation in the Mersberg anomaly. This we find much more if we combine the heat from the granite with the convective, oops, let's change the color, convective heat transport. And the convective heat transport takes into account water, and this water is transported upward along a fault. One of these many faults I've shown you before in the seismic profile. These two, these three factors again, a heat source, a fracture, and a transport medium such as water is necessary for convective heat transport in a thermally normal area such as the Franconian Basin, for example. So with this model, we can um, model quite nicely the actual situation in the Franconian Basin. And finally, to make a last move, back towards uh, the Americas, and in this case to South America, to Colombia, the Paipa area, very famous for its uh, hot springs, uh, spas, and so on. We make a map, of course, make a lot of investigations there, geothermal, uh, ge geochemistry investigations, uh, geophysical investigations, and end up with a model where we have a heat source again, here, which could be maybe magma chamber, whatsoever. We have water flowing, cold water down, towards the heat source, hot water up. We can model our faults whatsoever. We get an idea about the entire system and in the end we can um, characterize spots where we want to drill to know more about our area from our uh, superficial, superficial reconnaissance study going into deep, into depth. So we go from geology, geophysics, geochemistry, maybe geomechanics, via modeling towards drilling. And that's where we could continue our webinar, but I think we have really well filled our time, and the next webinar could then be about, yes, uh,
drilling, the test drilling, production drilling towards the plants installation. But that's then the topic of another webinar. So we have several messages for you to take home. Okay, first of all, geothermal energy is available everywhere. It could be superficial, near surface geothermal energy. It could be petrothermal energy. It is always and everywhere available. We can use geothermal energy for heat and for power. Of course, we can only need the, um, the deep systems, the hydrothermal system, petrothermal systems, heat deep systems with temperatures above 150 degrees for power production. The other systems, near surface systems, can well be used for district heating whatsoever. Very important in terms of power production. Geothermal energy is base load capable in contrast to other renewable energies. For a successful geothermal project, that's what I was a point I was stressing always. We need a heat source, we need a transport medium, we need water, and we need pathways, faults, pore space for uh, the other water which exchanges or uh, collects the heat from the rock and to transport it upward. Okay, we have learned about geothermal power plants, the main types. Dry steam, flash, binary, which all can be combined as well and then also can be combined with direct heat use. And to characterize our reservoir, to make it really a successful system, we need to combine all geology, geophysics, geochemistry, geomechanics and combine them all in a model and then we can head on from there to the drilling process. Thank you very much.